In this Q&A video, we're going to answer the question, should I be spacing out the circuit protective devices in a consumer unit? Now, just before we explain the answer to this question, please be aware that this video is one of a series that we've made on the subject of circuit protection. They can be viewed individually, or you can click the link in the description below to view them as part of a free online training package to help you with your CPD and receive a certificate to prove you've completed the course. If you move in the same social media circles as me, then you may have noticed a trend for electricians to install protective devices into consumer units and leave gaps between each one, maybe with spacing blanks in between them. Why are they doing this? And is it necessary? After all, if you're leaving gaps between devices in a consumer unit, it could lead to the need for a bigger board and higher costs. Well, it all boils down to something called thermal derating and the rated diversity factor. MCBs and the overcurrent part of an RCBO rely on sensing temperature as an indicator for when too much current passes into a circuit. They contain an element called a bimetallic strip that the current flowing into the circuit passes through. It's called bimetallic because it's made of two different pieces of metal welded together. These two metals are carefully selected to expand at different rates as they get hot. As more current flows, the strip gets hotter, and as the two pieces of metal expand at different rates, the strip as a whole will bend and cause the device to operate or trip, thus disconnecting the circuit when too much current flows. Because the process of monitoring overcurrent is so dependent on heat, the bimetallic strip can be affected by other sources of heat. This may be from the ambient temperature of the room that it's installed in, or even the heat generated by neighbouring MCBs or RCBOs. This heat from external sources can start to cause an issue with the accuracy of the bimetallic strip. If it's being heated up from elsewhere and then also has the heat generated by the current passing through it, the protective device will start to trip at a lower current value than it should do, meaning it could start disconnecting circuits that are operating healthily. For many situations, this is no more than a nuisance. After all, who wants to start grobbling around in the consumer unit halfway through a shower? But if the now oversensitive device is protecting a critical circuit, then it could cause some serious problems if it disconnects when it doesn't need to. This is the kind of situation where thermal derating comes into effect. The rated diversity factor we mentioned earlier is a number between zero and one. And that's applied to the nominal rating of the circuit breaker to reduce the value of that rating to a more realistic level. It's similar to how we derate the amount of current a cable can carry when it's bunched together with a load of other cables. More on that in a moment. But first of all, is it necessary to space all protective devices out no matter what they're feeding? Well, this is where the designer of the installation, who may well be the installer as well, even if it's something as simple as a consumer unit change, needs to analyze the circuits and the types of load they're feeding. In the past, you'd probably just figure out how much current the circuit would typically draw and leave it at that. However, it's really important to also consider how long the circuit will be energized for. In an article on derating factors, the IET made reference to continuous and intermittent loads, pointing out that these are not clearly defined in BSEN 61439, which is the series of standards relating to low voltage switch gear and control gear assemblies. However, they do encourage you to be cautious with loads that are likely to be on for more than half an hour. The IET also suggests that for a circuit that is on for longer than it is off during a given period could be characterized as a sustained load and that intermittent loads can be characterized as loads that are inactive for longer periods than they are active, typically with on times shorter than 30 minutes, and that appliances like hobs and washing machines that draw heavier currents will have complex cycles switching on and off at different times, and so can be considered intermittent loads also. The circuits that can cause us the problems with heat in circuit protection devices are ones feeding loads that are continuous and draw currents that are close to the nominal rating of the device. In properties that use consumer units, which is what we're discussing in this video, those circuits would be things like EV charge points, heat pumps, and PV panel circuits bringing electricity into the electrical installation through a circuit protective device. Many circuits simply won't be on for long times or will draw very small amounts of current. For example, an electric shower might use a lot of current, but not for very long, and so the protective device won't get too hot. Or a lighting circuit might be on for a few hours at a time, or all day if you have teenage children. But with the advances in LED lighting, the current drawn, even if the entire circuit was on, would be small. So if you had a consumer unit with three circuits feeding an EV charge point, an air source heat pump and a PV system in the same consumer unit, and they're all likely to be in use at the same time, then it may be time to look at how you should be installing them to prevent any detrimental influence between each other. In BSEN 61439-3, we find a table of assumed loading factors. These can be used as the highest rated diversity factor of the protective device. Many brands will have their own data and variations on these figures, and for the most up-to-date information, you should always consult the manufacturer's data. 
but many brands, Luden included, use this table as the standard reference. It's also worth noting that other documents in the BSEN IEC 61439 series have slightly different values for other situations. In this video, we're discussing information for a particular type of distribution board intended for operation by ordinary persons, or in other words, a consumer unit. So if you have two or three grouped and continuously loaded circuits, you apply a factor of 0.8. This simply means that the device is likely to trip out at 80% of the value it would do if it weren't grouped with other heavily and continuously loaded circuits. This factor gets applied to the design current of the circuit, so if our EV charge point has a power rating of 7.5 kilowatts, we'd then need to divide 7,500 by 230 volts, giving us a design current of 32.6 amps. This design current then gets divided by the rating factor of 0.8 in this example, which gives us 40.75 amps. And this is the value that we'd use to select our protective device. So the next breaker size up from Luden is 50 amps. And then if we want to provide overload protection to the circuit, we'd use this 50 amps rating to size the cable. So you can see that this rated diversity factor can materially impact on the circuit design and may end up needing a larger cable size installing. But then people may start to say, surely if you've done all this calculation and you believe the breaker will trip at a lower value due to the increased heat of the loaded circuits, then the cable is already protected by that lower tripping value. And yes, there is an element of truth to that. However, there's two points to consider. The first is that you'd be relying on everything operating together all the time as you've assumed. In summer, the heat pump may or may not be running. In winter, the current from the PV circuit may be smaller and so on and so on. So that could cause you some problems and you may end up with a cable that is undersized for the protective device. The other problem is that the design information in BS7671 doesn't take this thermal derating into account. And so your installation could end up being non-compliant if you don't size the cable against the increased breaker size. So could you box a bit clever and carry out your design and installation in such a way that the thermal derating becomes unnecessary? Well, you could, as discussed at the outset, separate the protective devices from each other and fill in the gaps with blanks to help dissipate the heat generated. However, this can lead to larger boards and more cost to the consumer. So another way that you could mitigate those additional considerations in the design process is to book a tradition long held as the done thing when installing consumer units. Ask any apprentice undertaking their first consumer unit installation and they'll solemnly tell you that you'll need to put the highest rated breaker next to the main switch or RCCB and then install them in descending order. There's no real requirement anywhere in any regulations for this other than that's the way that we've always done it. You could argue that it limits the highest level of current to just the section of buzz bar next to the main switch, but again, that buzz bar is designed to take all the current for that board along its length, so there's no reason to limit it to just one section. If you place devices feeding heavier, more sustained loads between ones feeding less heavily loaded circuits, like the lighting or smoke alarm circuits or similar, then you can help mitigate the thermal derating issue. So there we go, that's what we mean by thermal derating and why you may see people spacing out their protective devices. But we mentioned earlier a circuit bringing in current from a PV installation. To find out how that could cause a serious problem to your consumer unit installation, check out this video right here. Or click the link to watch it as part of our free training package to help you with your CPD and you'll receive a certificate as well. All that remains in this video is to say thank you very much for watching.